And uh, so Martin uh, got his uh, PhD at uh, MIT with Wolfgang Ketterle. And then, uh, then uh, so he uh, immediately after, uh, or maybe even before, before, uh, before defending his PhD, or, pro, uh, or immediately after, he got a professorship at MIT. Uh, but he went for, to do a postdoc uh, with uh, Emmanuel Bloch, and then he started, uh, he started as a faculty at MIT. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks for having me. My first time in Stockholm. And, uh, I love it. I already heard I have to visit the ship. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about uh, uh, university spin transport. It's from the Fermi guys. Now, uh, I saw how, how, how things work here. Uh, this will take forever. <laughs> uh, so I could decide to either. Uh, skip a couple of slides or something, or I don't know, we'll just, just go along and, 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 and see, see how it goes. Because I, uh, okay, so see these introductory slides, for example. <laughs> uh, like this is what we are here for, you know, understanding strongly directing Fermi gases. Um, well, it's more than to say the game. Ah, uh, oh, you mean oh, the top? That's the top. That's the top. That's the top. Much better. Yours was cut off as well. Oh, no. Just a little bit there. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's what, what, what we're here for to really understand okay. strong okay. gases, um, which occur everywhere in high disease and, and nuclear physics and nuclear matter, or the, the quark gluon plasma. We have soup of quarks and, and, and gluons um, that, that we can create now in these. Uh, uh, huge accelerators where we shoot two gold ions on top of each other, and then uh, we create a, a strongly directed gas of fluency. Now, in atomic Fermi gases, we have uh, the nice opportunity to really control the strongly interacting Fermi system very nicely. We can control the interactions. Um, the spin composition, we can have a few spin ups in, in, immersed in a spin down cloud um, uh, as we like. Um, we can even have three spin states, uh, up, down, and right, I don't know, um, if, if you want. Um, and all the parameters of the collisions uh, are precisely known. That's wonderful because then we can compare it directly to many body theories. So what we what we really love to do is first, uh, one thing is we realize models that have been around uh, uh, in, in many body physics, uh, Usually you start a theory, people be like, okay, let's take a Fermi gas of, of something and then increase the interactions. But it's all like models uh, of thought. But now we actually have a system where we can play with, with such a model matter. And it's just a, um, a wonderful uh, uh, opportunity. And, and what, what's always nice is that um, when, you, when you walk around this, this infinite space of possibilities in, in these other quote gases, you sometimes find new states of matter that people hadn't really thought about it would be possible to create. And that's, of course, very exciting. And sometimes you see, uh, see pictures like these, where you have a magnetized uh, gas. There is a paired gas in the center, uh, spin down and out to the right, spin up, spin up down to the, um, to the left. And uh, it, it's just one picture, magnetized superfluidity, just in one picture that, that we take just simply by projecting the shadow of these gases onto, onto the camera. Um, so that's how it looks like, you know, if you want to do it, if that's what you have to build. Uh, but, but in all fact, I mean, there hasn't been a single phase that's not, you know, that's, that's novel. You know. <laughs> well, but you are here. Yeah. <laughs> so you must be interested in something. No, no. That has been <laughs> <laughs> it is made of cold atoms. Ah, that's, 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 that's right. Very so, cold, yeah. So, so, for example, you could say, ah, the BCBCS crossover, old head, we knew about it. There was no system such as the, the BCBCS crossover where you could tune it actually like 
you could do in, in, in theory. Right. Now you might say, okay, but it's not. I'm not saying all phases in new regimes are interesting, but so it's not. It doesn't have to be. He's saying the theorists hmm. have not done anything new. <laughs> <laughs> no, other way around. Theorists have. <laughs> 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 but you know, it's, it's. And then you could say, okay, so the polarized Fermi gases. Uh, uh, at, at first, we were kind of off. Uh, at least you would agree quantitatively with the description of, of the polarized Fermi gases. Now our understanding is is uh, kind of uh, it's more simple. We have a phase separation between uh, a known superfluid kind of state and a rather okayishly known uh, uh, Fermi liquid type of state with polarons. And things settle down. Dust settles down, and we we, we feel we. We are confident now that, that with all the history of, of anybody physics, we can still understand what's mm -hmm. what's going on. But there, there are always these slight surprises that um, uh, that, that come about here and there. And uh, who knows? Maybe at some point you you actually find something which is which is truly completely out of the ordinary, out of uh, completely normal. But it's always like that. Right? You find a new s state in, in condensed matter. Uh, some some new material, uh, it has completely unknown properties, and and then suddenly you find, oh, wait a second, I have this model from like back in the days which I can apply, and it kind of works, and that settles generally. <laughs> That's what we hope. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it always surprises. So, so I, I I'm I'm not a fan of, it's all no. It's no no. I didn't say that. All I mean is that you don't. <laughs> You, you don't have to appeal to you know new phases that the theorists have dropped up. You know, there's it's interesting in its own right, just <laughs> just because you can access these new regimes and yep. you'll be even old phases. You know. Yeah. Uh, it, it would be good if, if if we would say we have learned something new. You know, sometimes, for example, is there a pseudo gap phase uh, right above TC in these strongly directing Fermi gases? I wouldn't say that's cast in stone. I mean, there are papers with the title "Observation of the Pseudo Gap Phase in Strong Gap Fermi Gases," but for those papers, I have seen papers with that title. I have seen papers with that title too. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it's cast in stone. Yeah. It's not a clear-cut story. So, since we, we are not so sure whether we understand everything, or we you know have to move forward. <laughs> Good. So, so how, how we do it is we take uh, lithium six. Uh, it's a, a lovable atom. Really. It's wonderful because we can uh, we can tune the interactions uh, in such a magnificent uh, way. We take the two lowest hyperfine states. Lithium six has a spin one half and a nuclear spin one. So it gives you six states to play with. But we, we mostly focus on the lowest two. Sometimes we play with two and three or something. Uh, but essentially, these are our up and down spins, and then. Uh, a long, for a long time it was known that the background interaction is already very strong, so it was very interesting to go for these type of gases. But then, amazingly, the tool of Feshbach resonances came about, which even allowed us to tune freely the, the scattering things. Martin, um, yeah. sorry, elementary question. So one and two are what and just the type of fine? See, what? So we just remind me what one and two I, are in terms of the six guys. Ah, um, uh, so in, in the high field basis, uh, you, you get uh, three states which have their electron spin up and mm -hmm. three states with their electron spin down. And these three states now differ only by the nuclear magnetic moment. And uh, the MI, quantum number, um, would be uh, minus one here, zero for this guy, and plus one for this guy. And they differ in energy by 80 megahertz. That's uh, related to the hyperfine splitting here at zero field, uh, the coupling between the nucleus and the electron spin. So it's nice, this is 80 megahertz, and it's really radio frequency that you use you know, to listen to music. So you can actually just shine in some 80 megahertz radio frequency and drive a transition between one and two, for example, and do spectroscopy on these systems. Very handy. Uh, what's not so handy is we have to develop optical traps to, to trap these atoms in the, in the focus on the laser beam. But that's, you know, that's coming into Take an infrared uh, laser beam focus it somewhere and the atoms want to go there because they're little polarizable particles. They just want to go in the, uh, when the uh, intensity, field intensity is high for infrared uh, light. Far tuned from the atomic resonance. And then there are some magnetic coils that are used to, to tune the, uh, 
bias magnetic field that would actually be useful to two of the mesh resonances. And these guys, which would be little ones, are curvature coils which provide a little bit of axial confinement to our atoms. So it's healthy. healthy. Uh, now this is the uh, this is of course the, the wrong picture. Uh, this is not what happens in our lab uh, in, in the interferometric interaction, but it's kind of nice to uh, to again um, think about a simple square band interactions and um, where you can pull the depth of the square well over here you have weak attraction, no bound state, the scattering length is negative. Right on resonance, a bound state appears, the scattering length diverges of a strong attraction in the deep bound state positive A. Now that's not what we do, we actually uh, play another trick uh, to move a bound state into the interatomic potential. Uh, that's the Feschbach uh, resonance that I don't know, probably you have uh, yeah, heard of it. It's simply uh, bring the, the energy of two free atoms into resonance with the energy of this molecular bound state, which is a slightly different magnetic moment, so you can do it. And the knob in the lab is just the overall magnetic field. Uh, the two free atoms shift differently, a uh, different magnetic moment from the molecular state, so you can bring them into resonance. Uh, good, so that allowed us to uh, study the BC basis crossover I was talking about so between tightly bound molecules and, and uh, a BCS state. Uh, we couldn't quite get the BCS state, we could get something in the middle uh, where the pair size is on the order of the interparticle spacing, so a super strongly directing particles which, which pair up and very likely they change partners every time. Um, it's, it's a very, uh, uh, very strongly interacting matter. And it was possible to observe superfluidity in these, in these gases by rotating the clouds and observing vortex lattices. Um, so what is it's, it's, oh. it's the limitation of number of particles it's, that makes you prevents you from going deeper to BCS? Ah, yeah, temperature, temperature. temperature. So in the BCS state, uh, BCS. the temperature, the critical temperature is exponentially suppressed because the binding energy is so mm -hmm. fluffy, so very, very small. And so unfortunately, with our typical cooling techniques, we are limited to say the record is 0.03 times the Fermi temperature. If you drop below that, uh, the state is, is dead, it's a little superfluid. Mm -hmm. And uh, that uh, tells you that you're, you will always be limited to pair size, which is on the order, maybe a little bit larger, but not much larger than okay. the particle spacing. Yeah. So that's what kills you. There's another thing that kills you, population imbalance. Yeah. Uh, if you had a, a typical interaction strength, like a couple of hundred Bohr radii in terms of the scattering length, uh, you would need to match the spin up and spin down numbers by you know, better than whatever, 10 to the uh, minus 5 difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so there's also this Croxton limit uh, that, that uh, we study that will also kill you. So the BCS state is unfortunately uh, not, uh, not easily accessible with, uh, with our... What, in terms of KFA, what KFA can you get? To About minus 1. Minus 1, okay, right, right. Yeah. And, and then we see that we, we just stop goes. seeing any vortices, yeah. we don't see any condensate friction. It just looks like a normal, normal Fermi gas. Yeah. yeah, so what was exciting in the subject was we were able to just uh, tune the imbalance in these gases and go to um, the population imbalance gases, uh, where we now uh, understand uh, very well that at uh, zero temperatures, there's phase separation between the superfluid core and the surrounding cloud of uh, unpaired atoms. Um, uh, now it's not quite as boring, uh, even, even in this, in this, paired non, uh, this unpaired non-superfluid uh, phase that we can uh, see in, in its clearest form here at very high imbalance, where there's no superfluid, uh, there are still extremely strong directions between spin up and spin down. So that's, that's why it was interesting to see what does the gas do here? Is, is that really just uh, just some... some but uh, at what interaction? Uh, this particular picture is a slightly bit on the BEC side of things. Uh, one of a KVA of 0.2. <laughs> it's pretty much resonant, a resonant gas. You get the same picture at minus 0.2. It's pretty much the same. The only thing that changes uh, is the critical imbalance where you lose the, the superfluid core. So that's, that's an old story that I didn't want to know how we mapped it out and all. <laughs> so the, on the, on the x-axis is the imbalance, is that yours? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. I should label it. Mm. Of course you could just look at it and say, <laughs> <laughs> must be, must be, must be imbalance. Um, so so what's, what's, 
really cute to think about is this, this impurity problem. What happens if there's just one fermion here uh, <laughs> uh, swimming in his, in his Fermi C? And uh, of course, these impurity problems are just you know, one of the nuts and bolts of, of bread and butter <laughs> of the college metaphysics. You have uh, electron chains for lattices, of course, uh, which you describe as a polaron problem. The condo problem is exciting. It's a single magnetic impurity that maybe it's almost good. You know, get there and put many of them in the lattice, you know, many of these condo impurities, see what happens. Um, or like mixing, mixing two, uh, mixing fermionic fluid and bosonic fluid. Uh, if you know something about these impurities, we know a lot about the, the state itself. And the, of course, the classic problem was, was Landau, uh, Landau's photoron, where you have the electron dressed with the, uh, with the cloud of fermions. And well, uh, we have to see that there must be addressed energy for this, for this electron moving in this crystal lattice. A certain weight z, uh, the probability that if you take a picture, it looks like a bare electron. Um, it has an effective mass, and you find it everywhere. Like wherever an electron moves through some crystal lattice, you will have uh, phonons that, that, will, that will dress it. And if, I guess in cases where you don't, it's going to be interesting. So in, in, in our very basic system, we have uh, just uh, a few, 5% or so, blue atoms immersed in, in a sea of reds, so like spin down, sea of spin up. Uh, and we can, of course, ask what happens to the molecule, um, uh, what's the energy of a molecular state when we have tight binding, or for weak attraction, we have just this bare guy floating about, uh, just feeling a weak mean field interaction. And then in the middle, there's this polaron that we have already heard about, uh, that's my picture. <laughs> the guy's dragging a little bit the, 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 the red ones closer to it and, and forms a, 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 a polar on the blue guy with the, with the reds. It's, of course, completely exaggerated. If you, even for the strongest interactions, if you calculate how many more spin up atoms are close to this blue guy just because of the blue guy being there, it's at most one. Do you know that your picture is not entirely correct? Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I haven't said that there's a smooth transition between these pictures. I correct them differently. Yeah. So, so you have this picture, there's a smooth transition between these pictures. I call them differently. Yeah. So, so your point, Boyle's point, is always, and I, 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 I find it's, it's very important, that the molecule is, of course, a bosonic entity, and this guy is a fermionic entity. But I haven't said that these guys evolve smoothly into okay. each other, so I'm safe. <laughs> 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 so for weak attraction, uh, we have, we have of course a mean field kind of interaction. Uh, our blue impurity fields the density of spin ups with the scattering length a between them. The molecule is because this energy h squared squared and the energy in the middle. Well, we have heard already about the shapey ansatz, so I don't have to go into. And the details oh, the, the outcome was. No, uh, huh? Martin. Oh. So far, we had in our theoretical <laughs> agenda the Berta ansatz, yes, which is a very well known ansatz for fields. Now, what we get is the so called shape ansatz. Maybe this will become something famous. You should explain us what this is. I, okay, I will. I will. Thank so far, I just stated his result 0. 0.6. Yeah. No, just figure out since you asked for it. Um, but, but we had it on the board already, so, so it's simply, I mean, Shady's ansatz was, I mean, the surprise is that it works so well, right? The, the ansatz itself makes complete sense. You start with uh, nothing is going on, the spin down lives happily, uh, coexists with the Fermi C, with a certain probability phi naught, and there's the uh, second state, the particle hole excitation, the blue guy kicks out the spin up, and that's it. And if you just leave out all the, all the higher order terms, it turns out you can, of course, wonderfully solve it. It's a very nice homework problem. And it gives a terrible formula, but um, you can just uh, do it. And it gives you a wonderful formula, which seems to interpolate and force <laughs> uh, between the mean field solution and the molecular uh, limit. Again, I'm not implying that the polar becomes a molecule. But what is, you, you did it very quickly, what, what was A, 0.6, what is that? I mean, the, sorry, so I did that too quick. Um, I just don't want to uh, 
bore you. So, oh, okay. so, so, so uh, Martin, but at this point I have to correct because Chevy's ansatz can be generalized to molecule as well. Yeah. So it's not like Chevy's ansatz interplays between the two. It can be applied and we have a previous yeah. that. But it's, it's a different it's a different, it's different uh, because then you start with with, 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 the, with the model. It's a part yeah. of it. Chevy's ansatz is essentially truncated wave function, yeah. which is yeah. truncated yeah. to the first two terms here. Absolutely. So, so Martin, you said it works then, so how do we know it works then? Yeah, well, because you ask Boris yeah. to do a quantum exact calculation. Exact like many more calculation, it, it is right on. I, I'll, I'll have it actually on the, I see. On the slide. So, so this was, by the way, this is the textbook problem here. Uh, you have a spin down atom immersed in a spin up cloud with unitarity limited interactions. Looks like that should be something that has been solved like 30, 40 years ago. Nope, it hasn't been. Um, it is within clear. the variational ansatz, it's Mm -hmm. uh, it goes and you get, you get 0.6 okay. uh, with the variation of mm -hmm. But surprisingly now also with the uh, exact diagrammatic Monte Carlo calculation. Yeah. I should totally include in this picture, uh, but I haven't, um, the molecular uh, energy also using Chevy's under for the molecules. Yeah. Yeah. Is uh, it just a variation of wave function or just three? Yeah. Okay. It's so it is surprising that it it is absolutely oh, surprising. Sorry, it's mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it accidental the coincidence or not? Yeah, sort of, because it's basically you, you are saying that, uh, uh, well, it's not that coincidental because you can say, okay, for, for, from general consideration, you say that how many uh, numbers do you need? Or the unit, they say five. But the fact that if, uh, two terms <laughs> are accurate with, with percent, uh, just, uh, that you get percent accuracy with just two terms, that's what what is an X. Yeah, I mean, I explained in the. I, I really liked your your yeah. small momentum expansion kind of mm -hmm. story. Like if you if you do that, you know, um, you see that mm -hmm. high order terms true. cancel, um, and that's actually what Combisco uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's um, what that's like. used to uh, go beyond the shady mm -hmm. uh, wave function. He, he wrote down uh, mm -hmm. a real series of uh, high order terms expanding the problem in small momentum. That uh, gave, gave uh, a nice series of terms which converged to, to the exact result. So it's a very cute, very cute problem. You're, you're strongly interacting here, but you can get really a number. Uh, it's amazing. Um, the black dots here, th th those are the diagrammatic Monte Carlo calculations by uh, uh, Boris and Nicolas over there. Um, I haven't put here the point 0.6, but it's there. And the white dots are the solution for the molecule problem. If you put, uh, instead of a, a single down atom, you put a molecule in this Fermi C. It's also a polaron, so to speak. I said it's a polaron. And, uh, <laughs> and that guy has its own. Yeah, the transition is at what time? The transition is at, at uh, 0.9. 0.9, yeah. Um, that's where the two energies cross. And uh, as, as Boris would point out now, is, is that these are really two different. Uh, worlds like one is a boson, one is a fermion, so it should really be a crossing and not a mixing, not some kind of avoided right. crossing. But it's, it's, I mean, you can couple the two, you can easily write down a wave function that couple the two. It's not like, like they live in different universes. Alpha 1 plus beta 2. Plus you can couple a molecule with a polaron plus two particles in the whole. I mean, you can write that it's down. A it's, a it's, just, it's, it's a decay, but it's not like they live in hybridization. It's, it's not a magic quantum is, number uh, thing. It's excluded mm -hmm. by, uh, by, by the conservation laws. But uh, decay is not, uh, is not excluded. So what you would write down, that, that thing would not be stable. That would you, you can calculate the decay. It's not like yeah. that. Yeah. Right. So yeah, you can write it down and uh. calculate what's the lifetime uh. of this thing. Yeah. Yeah, so. um, great. Um, so um, now how do we measure it, actually, in the, the lab? Uh, well, we, we take, again, um, all these states I cancelled, but now I didn't cancel the third guy because we need it for RF spectroscopy, um, which is a, it's a nice, nice tool. So we, have, we have now three states in the picture. These two are usually populated, and this, this one was empty so far, but now we drive a radio frequency transition from spin down, say, into the empty state three, and we know exactly, you know, with atomic clock, clock precision, what that uh, frequency should be uh, in the absence of interactions. So once we, once we know that, uh, we can see what happens once I switch on an interaction, for example, a molecule, and I will measure the binding energy of that, uh, that molecule. I first have to break up the molecule, and then I can transfer the blue guy 
into the empty state. Yeah. Of course, I can also do this with even more energy. Then the energy will go into kinetic energy of the remnants. They will fly away with some finite momentum. Um, so the spectra, typical molecular spectra, look like these. There's nothing happening at the bare resonance frequency that we know with precision. But you have to first dial in a binding energy, and then you get some onset of, of the transfer from blue to three. And uh, there's this very interesting tale coming from the fact that, yes, even at higher energies, you can still um, transfer, uh, break the molecule and transfer the blue guy into the third set. But now we have given uh, kinetic energy also to the remnants. And there's a typical um, density of state suppression of that. Density of state going like a square root of epsilon, but there's a one over epsilon square uh, tail from the wave function from the pair. Good. Um, now we do it with one and three, to be honest. We prepare the impurity in one and the majority in three, or the other way around, because we like to go with both guys, either from one to two or from three to two. That's convenient. And what's also convenient is that this second state here is weakly interacting with either one or three, so it doesn't really come into the picture. At least we understand its interaction very well. So it's a very good trial state. It's like a tunneling experiment where you want to tunnel from a known state, uh, sorry, from unknown state, like a superconductor or something, um, to a, a known state, a normal metal. You don't want your normal metal that you tunnel to to be complicated. So this metal here, state two, is non or almost non-interactive. For four or mesh. See? For four or mesh as well, when you eject a particle into your yeah, it turns out for full emission, you have to even be even uh, more weakly interacting than we are with state two. Our state two would still get stuck um, once it, it tries to walk out. Yes, in uh, potassium, David Jin's experiments wonderfully uh, allow you to really kick out the transfer atom. It pretty much doesn't interact at all with, with its surroundings, so you can check ah, how many atoms did I shoot out and give momentum. It gives you momentum information as well. Uh, so this is, the, this is the experiment. We um, perform the transfer, take a picture immediately of the arriving atoms in the free state. Looks like this, for example. It tells us, aha, at this point in space, at this density, uh, we have transferred such and such uh, so many atoms. And we check how many speed downs we had, how many speed ups we had. Uh, it's all done in a spatially resolved way. We can, uh, since our trap is cylindrical symmetric, we can really know at what uh, real density, 3D density, the transfer has happened. Not only uh, some integrated trap average, that's nice. And, and so we get local spectra uh, free from the, from the trap. Um, so this now happens in the molecular limit. Uh, when, we have, when we have molecules, we get these characteristic molecular spectra that I just showed um, where there's an onset and then a, a nice spectrum. Uh, for the majority, you get the same. You get a huge response, of course, uh, at zero shift, because many of these atoms don't even see this uh, spin down guy. They're just happily uh, coexisting. And then, of course, there's also some part which is exactly matched with the minority. Those are the, the blue guys that have been bound to the, to the red guy. This is really exactly matched. We didn't you know, put the two graphs on top of each other or something like that. It's really the same exact uh, response. And now, of course, when, the, when we weaken the interactions, we switch over to a totally different story. Suddenly, we have this peak popping out of the minority, which is no longer matched by the majority. So now we have something different. Um, well, that's the emergence of the photon. A delta-like peak, may I say. Well, within our resolution, this is pretty delta-like. Um, we cannot actually distinguish it from a delta. Well, it shouldn't be a perfect delta-like, but let me not uh, go astray. Um, on top of a broad background. The background, again, is matched between <coughs> spin up and, and the, the bath. Uh, it's at, at large momenta, at large energies, we are talking to large momenta, meaning short distances, and there it's a it's a two-body story, two particles. A spin up will only be one spin down at very short distances. Uh, that's because the gas is diluted. 
So those are the specific class of AI. Why aren't they offset? Like why, like the, the initial, like with the low energy state, they should have like why is there a space between the red and the blue core? Ah, uh, which is like, I mean, in, in like in the first program. Yeah. Like there's the atoms that weren't bound at all initially. Yeah, they're here, they're here, uh, around zero. Yeah. This is our delta-like response of non-interacting uh -huh. blue atoms in the, in the bath. But then there's just none of them at the higher energies? Yeah. Well, some, right? These guys. Only the ones that are bound in the molecules with the impurity. They are uh -huh. still. Yeah. So it's an exact... Here, yeah, it's, it's clear that the story is, is uh, two-body-like. Yeah? It's really mm -hmm. molecular-like. For every red guy, there's a blue guy bound to the, the same one and the same molecule. But over here, the story must be completely different. Uh, we have a huge response for our impurity spin at some shift in energy, but no response, uh, not, not a huge response in the, in the background. I'm just looking at low, low frequencies. What is that on the left figure? Low weak interaction, what, what happens when they don't match? Here where they don't match. Ah, yeah, so this is... <laughs> our rendition of the delta function. This, if you had infinite resolution, if you would use an extremely long pulse, yes. this would be completely peaked right, at zero. There would be nothing here. Right. And then it would come up. But since we, we uh, have to use a finite pulse time, we have a Fourier limit. So that's just solution. an atomic line? Is that how this, is, this is what I would call an atomic line. Okay. So this is what you would get if you had no impurities at all you would also get this, this okay. peak. If you add like a couple of impurities in this weakly interacting molecular regime, what happens is that they just bind their share of partners, but that's it. That's the only, only thing they, they do. It, excuse me. So what is exactly happening at the point where the blue curve no longer has a peak? Well, I would call it the polar onto molecule transition. Yeah. That's, that's when the guys are a little confused and what it has to do. Um, if it's epsilon on the molecular side, ah, it will eventually form a molecule. On the other side, it will form polarons. I can, can well imagine that here we have a mix of the two. Yeah, it's just, you know. <laughs> In the bulk, there would be exactly one or the other. When they are close to the point of transition, we are supposed to have two, uh, two distinct states a molecule. Mm -hmm. And a uh, polaron yeah. because uh, the upper state uh, is metastable. Mm -hmm. So, is it a matter of resolution that you do not see two peaks, or what? Uh, the molecules, um, well, the molecules in this experiment, the experiment is a single particle excitation experiment. Mm -hmm. it, it would give us molecular spectra like these, uh, whereas for the polaron, it gives us spectra like these. Now, it's not easy to uh, to say, oh, this is. I, I would, I would, I would. My point is that there should be two distinct energies, energies uh, uh, for the resonance, because you you have mm -hmm. both in one and the same system. So you fix. I'm not sure whether we have that. That's. I mean, within our resolution, I don't think we could say that even. Uh, that, that, that's my question. So, given uh, the theoretical result for, for for the distance between the two, mm -hmm. can you just show this distance on your plot so that we, we could see that your V actually is, is larger than, because otherwise I, I, I'm not yeah. comfortable, so, because somehow I know that there are two look states. Look at the mm -hmm. scale, right? So yeah. this is the Fermi energy, one, two, three Fermi energy. Our resolution is given by the width of this peak, uh -huh. yeah, um, which is maybe you know, 0.2 or so Fermi energy size. Mm -hmm. It's still rather large compared to the minute difference between the molecular see, energy see, and I the see, polar I energy see. around the transition re point. Cannot resolve. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't I claim see, anything see, here. Know, oh, this must be a molecule. This must yeah. be a polar. But whenever I see a little bit of stuff sticking out, I know there must be some polarons there. Yeah. Because that okay. cannot be. Plus, in those squares, you've normalized their strengths somehow. And how exactly you've normalized them to, in the first one, you superimposed the peaks? Or? I did not superimpose the peaks. That's exactly what you, you just measure how many atoms arrive at a given uh, RF pulse, and you count them. And as, as it turns out experimentally, you count exactly the same blues as, the, as, as reds in the molecular regime here, as well as in the wings in the polaron regime. 
it's not like fudged or we didn't put the spectra on top of each other or something like that. This is what comes out of the experiment. It's possible to see some sort of hysteresis in two states if you switch depending on time. You can see shift in curves. That would be uh, so. Probably the things well, would reset the point. It's a very the guys one. are metastable, like Gerald mentioned. It takes some time. Uh, in the morning, uh, you can just sweep, prepare yeah. deliberately, prepare polaroids. Yeah. And, and the hope would be that they're stable for longer than just a Fermi time scale. Uh, probably by something like a quasi particle distribution time. And, and so you have maybe time enough to then also take a spectrum. <laughs> Taking a spectrum means you also want to shine in your RF for a finite amount of time because you want uh, to, to narrow down your resolution. The longer you shine in your RF, the longer the atoms have time to resettle and, and decide what they actually want to be. So it's a race against. Time. I mean, we calculated the lifetime of these uh, polarons and the scales with the inverse of the energy difference to the nine halves. They are very longly lived because of these phase-based arguments. So uh -huh. perhaps that gives long uh, decay times. So, so maybe the whole is that we should be able yeah. to see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Remember, this is like, I mean, this is a finite density of impurities, right? So what yeah. the two continuum measuring is actually that well, the onset of phase. I mean, the different transition points, right? I think Th that's the other complication. Yeah. Yeah, that's the other one. This is this is a, a thermodynamic state which right. which has a finite number of spin downs, um, which if they become molecules and you're at zero temperature, they would phase separate. I doubt they'd be at zero temperature. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> and, and so there could still be a mix of molecules plus surplus atoms. So the molecules could still retain some character of the dressed molecules. Right. Precisely because of finite temperature. So right, but you're, but it's yeah. all like, ah, yeah, but you're not sitting, I mean, you won't really access that single particle transition effect, I think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The, the transition happens a little bit yeah. earlier than, yeah. than the uh, n plus 1 mm -hmm. bunny transition, uh, which I will, in principle, show. Just wanted to, to quickly explain uh, how, how you can go from Chev to the spectrum, <laughs> just because it's, it's cute, it's nice. Uh, here you had the Chev wave function, free particle with a certain weight and scattered state, and of course now you just transfer the, the blues into greens, for example, due to the RF pulse. The greens, let's assume, they're not interacting. So you can either end up with this final state, which has zero energy now, because the green is supposed to be non-interacting, but you came from a state which had E down, so of course you have to supply the, the polar binding energy, or the other option is to, uh, to transfer this guy, which had been uh, scattered out uh, in this particle mode excitation, and that guy, of course, has some kinetic energy. And then uh, we should really put this in some atomic physics over it's, it's fun to calculate then the RS spectrum. Uh, you get, of course, a delta function centered at E down with the weight Z that, that you are after, which is very nice, plus uh, some incoherent background, which is a continuum. This is the usual story. It, it, it's quite, quite nice. This is how we get, uh, get at the Z. Um, here I show the energy, uh, the measured energy as a function of interaction strength. Um, the uh, black line is the Chevy wave function, including the weak final state interactions that uh, we have in, in our final state. It's just a mean field contribution. And uh, well, it's, it fits quite nicely. Um, there's, of course, you know, that, that, that's a nice thing. It's a strong interacting system. And you might think there's no way there could be an exact number coming out of some theory. But no, here, in this problem, you, you can have it. And it, it, it works, works really, really well. Of course, our error bars are much larger than forces. What can we do? Uh, it has nothing to do with the bare molecule energy, for example, or, or an infuse result that completely explodes, of course, at resonance. So it's, it's a problem. Uh, I could show the Z. But then you will die. <laughs> there is a lot. Yeah, again, I don't know. So, so I, I tell you what I, what I have in, in stock. I have a, a very nice transport measurement <laughs> that I'm excited about. Um, but OK, uh, I can quickly flash the, the Z, which I, of course, don't have in here. Um, I, Uh, yeah, this is how we get the Z. This was the spectrum again, and we just count how much stuff do we have in the in the wings, how much stuff do we have in the peak. This is a very poor man's way of doing it, but 
uh, it's uh, it works. So the delta function is the green thing. Yes, yes. That yes. I associate with the green, or yeah. So, so that, that would be the z. Uh, now, of course, you could say, well, why don't you take this, yes, this whole part? Exactly. Sure. Yeah. We have, we have done this actually. We have we have done the two ways of fitting, and uh, of course, it gives you different result. Gives you more <laughs> stuff. Uh, that's that's not the not the point. Uh, the point would be, someone would have to calculate the spectra, overlap them with the experiment, and tell us what z is. Right. It, it, you know, the, without theory, we can, the only thing we can do is some ex exper experimentalist way of extracting Z. can either take just the stuff that's sticking out, or we take the whole thing here under this curve, those are two options, gives you two results, and hopefully the real one is in the middle. Yeah. So. And so the reason for the finite width is because of the instrument distribution. Yeah, so there are two things. The, uh, uh, the, the biggest contribution is just the Fourier limit. In fact, that's pretty much the Fourier limit. That is the Fourier limit of our uh, pulse. We have 200 microsecond pulse using 5 kilohertz uh, width. The Fermi energy is on the order of, of uh, 20 kilohertz or so. Um, so that gives you uh, sorry, uh, something like that. So it gives you the uh, 0.2 uh, Fermi. Yeah, you can read it off here pretty much. And um, in principle there is another contribution. You have a finite density of spin downs, mm -hmm. not just one. So there is actually Fermi C on those guys. Each of them has a slightly different transition uh, frequency. Uh, it would be exactly equal if the effective mass in the initial final state was equal, because then you wouldn't have to pay for the kinetic energy uh, increase by going to a state which has a, a lighter mass. But here there is a 10% difference, about 20 maybe, um, in the effective mass, so that gives you a slight contribution to the, to the width. But again, the big peak around zero, that's the majority guys that cost no energy to take out, right? Yeah. Who are not kind of far away from that uh, single impurity, and so they're not paired, and they're not influenced <coughs> by that interaction. Is that how I should think of it? Uh, yeah, so actually these guys, uh, if you work at a finite density, like 10%, 90 or 15%, 85, right. you do see already some influence on the, even on the spin-ups. Right, okay. because the presence of the spin-ups. But the zero thought is, is the zero order is, is just they're free they're spin untouched. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're untouched, centered around zero, but there are these rings. The rings are necessary right. for each uh, impurity that, that has a response here. There must have been a uh, majority atom that had kicked this guy out there. That's yeah. So we find, find equal contributions mm -hmm. in the rings. So you could probably fit that big to the rings. We could, yeah, yeah. We, did, we, did, we did it, yeah. It's not the point, you know. It's just, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so the Z number that comes out of this, it's not cast in stone. It depends on the fitting procedure. What's nice is to check how does Z depend on interaction strength or whatever. Because when it goes to zero, that should not depend on um, how we fit the, the peak. And this is this is that graph. So this, goes, this shows you the Z as a function of the interaction strength. Um, and uh, yes, it goes to something of the order of one in the weakly interacting limit, um, where you see, I mean, this is now getting into experimental resolution issues. There's some noise here, and you know, eventually. It, it, it's hard to say, like, oh, this is 100%. But if the gap, is that gap just, that's the 0.6 a year? Uh, the position? Yeah. The one, the one, and yeah. in physical units, that, that's the minus 0.6. That's the minus 0.6 uh, plus a slight 0.15 Correct. correction. Due okay, to but the zero thought that's the energy. Exactly. The binding, so, so the shift of this peak from zero, that, from that you can read off the binding. Okay. Uh -huh. And then as, as you go from here to here, this peak, uh, the, the area under the, under the peak shrinks, and uh, you become more and more molecular-like when the two overlap. And uh, at some point, you just stop seeing any difference between the spin-up and spin-down. Uh, plus, there's nothing sticking out, so it's, it's pretty much zero away. Um, so the transition would occur somewhere around 0 0.6, 0 0.8 or so, which is much closer to the thermodynamic transition for phase separation between molecules and polarons and not the 0.9 for the n plus 1 money calculation. And this is uh, just a plot of all this as a function of also purity concentration, which tells you not much is happening as you increase the purity concentration. All these height lines are pretty vertical. So uh, it looks like it's, it's a well-behaved Fermi liquid kind of story 
where as you add more and more spin downs, it doesn't change the story much. The, the interactions between these protons seem to be very weak. <coughs> and uh, the, that we have, of course, checked somewhere. Ah, yeah. So if you plot the energy as a function of the impurity concentration, which is essentially the peak position, the shift from zero, it's pretty much insensitive to the impurity concentration, uh, which is amazing. You have a spin up and spin down interact as strongly as quantum mechanics allows. It's a unitarity limit. Um, but the, the <coughs> interaction between the renormalized quasar particles on this problem, the photons, seems to be pretty much negligible. If you're very careful, you, 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 you want to say that there are actually two contributions to this line here. Um, as you increase the impurity concentration, you have this um, effect that, of course, now you have a Fermi C of these impurities, no longer a single guy. So you have this slight broadening and epsilon shift due to the effective mass not being one. That's, there's one contribution there. Um, um, and there, there is the actual interaction between the cos causal particles. Both effects seem to go at least according to uh, variational or one color calculations. We fix node seem to go the opposite way. So they might even cancel a little bit on this plot. So this this could be this could look less interacting than it might be actually. The interaction energy could be on the order of a few percent of the Fermi energy here. But it's cancelled by the M star effect, which goes the other way. And yeah, and that's why I, I, I like to call this like building the Fermi liquid from the bottom up. Because we just put one guy, one spin down, it redresses into a more into a quarteron, and then put all the all the others and to first order or zeroth order maybe, but even first order, they stay happy quarterons and almost don't interact with each other. Good. Um, little Fermi Collider, much cheaper than the, <laughs> <laughs> the big one. Yeah. So that's a uh, cost um, you know, What we do here is, is really measuring transport uh, of these Fermi gases. Uh, it's surprisingly difficult in quantum metal. That's the very first thing you do. You put some leads on your metal and measure the resistance. The very first thing you do. In cold damage, it's not. It's just somehow, you know, it's not our thing. <laughs> uh, it's not the first thing we, we, we like to do. But it's, of course, possible. And you can just, um, in, in this experiment, you can just split the two clouds and spin up and spin down, uh, switch on the strong interactions, and then let them slam against each other again to see what happens. Just, why not? Uh, of course, in, in Conan's matter, that's interesting for spintronics uh, kind of things, where you have materials which have an imbalanced number of spin up and spin down electrons. And you ask, OK, how? What is, this, what is this transport of the spin up the electrons through the spin down uh, cloud? Um, I'm learning about uh, neutrino diffusion uh, coming out of uh, supernovae that apparently transport the, the energy outwards of the, in these supernovae explosions. I have to learn much more about this, but it's, it's another spin transport problem where you have strongly interacting uh, gases or this, this quark gluon plasma. Uh, story strongly interacting guys, uh, which um, have interesting transport properties that uh, um, like a very low viscosity and all that. Um, that that are all interesting interesting problems. And here we have another strongly interacting Fermi gas that we can uh, where we can study transport. Uh, so how we do it is it's actually not so easy. Uh, we cannot split the clouds um, easily on resonance. At the Feshbach resonance, there the magnetic moments are very similar, extremely similar. So if you apply a magnetic field gradient to do a stein gala separation, you don't separate them. They move in the same direction. The electron spins are pretty much fully uh, aligned. So we have to do it at low fields where the magnetic moments are slightly different, and then switch on the interactions by quickly ramping to the Feshbach resonance, and then let them uh, smash into each other. We take, of course, uh, quickly pictures of spin up and spin down. We can measure the 
total density or the difference density, and, and that's then uh, the information that comes, comes out. To train our eyes, we can first jump on uh, the zero crossing of the flash buffer resonance, where the scattering length is zero, 540 Gauss. Um, we have two kinds of ways of looking at this. This is directly looking at the density difference. This is a more fancy way of also encoding the total density. Uh, if the total density is high, it will look darker. Uh, just pick one and, uh, and, uh, and look at it. Um, hope that works. Oh, I should have loaded this before. Now we wait a bit. It's cute though. Oh, <laughs> oh it's interesting to think. Recently, I was listening to a speech of one of our French politicians at the India Club. The guy was speaking four hours without interrupting. I won't do that. Then. Well, you will not get away with it here. The guy provides five of fundamental physics. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think I'm much pressing the button. Uh, so, this is what happens. Uh, if you look closely, the the blues and the reds switch sides, of course. They don't interact, so they just fly through each other. Um, uh, looks nice, but it's actually uh, uh, kind of Why are they not interacting two music festivals? So here we just jump to zero, to a zero of the fish So nothing happens. These guys are not It looks very pretty, I love it. But it's uh, nothing. nothing yeah, zero um, and then, of course, with interactions, now it's very different, very different stuff. So the two guys, they just essentially slam into each other, bang, like two cars in a car crash. But the density goes very, very high. It's very steep there in the, in the center. Um, really piles up. They don't want to uh, penetrate each other. And so they repel. And they do that a couple of times, actually. Uh, about six times. How much can they increase the density in the middle? Um, it's, 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 uh, it's really a sharp peak, uh, which we could even see like with very far detuned light, which is only sensitive then to, to very high density regions in, in, in our chart. So we'll roughly say 10 or so. Um, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, of course, uh, a lot of things are happening in this transition region. When you have high density of these guys, uh, you will also eventually, on the molecular side, form molecules, and then you have a molecular cloud, in addition to the spin-ups and the spin-downs, it's, it's really a messy situation. Uh, um, uh, but the fun thing is you can really get, uh, get uh, numbers out of, out of there, which, which you can then uh, compare to here. So this is again this, this bounce, in a time which is all sufficient, uh, where they bounce into each other and, and bounce off again. Um, so that's right on resonance. So that's, it turns out that's the strongest interaction. With, we checked that it peaks around, around resonance. This is where they really repel uh, the most. Um, and this is what they do at later times. See that they really bounce six times or so more, uh, into each other. And then they settle after, say, 200 milliseconds. This is a very long time. Um, the trapping period is roughly uh, 50 milliseconds. So this roughly corresponds to two oscillations. This frequency here is roughly, well, between one and a half or two times the tracking period. And it takes like 200 or so milliseconds before these guys have settled. But see, they haven't settled to zero distance, uh, but there's still a finite offset. And it takes seconds uh, for this offset to die out, to die away. So this is, this is a positive scattering? And this is right on resonance. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So do you have any estimate of temperature money? Yes, so that's exactly that. So, so we had this data for quite a while. We were like, oh, this is great. But uh, yeah, and now what, you know, what's the influence of temperature and all that? So we had to suffer and, and try to control temperature in this experiment. It was in the end not so hard because over this long time scale, you can actually cool still. The way we cool is simply we lower our trap depth. The hot atoms jump out and the cold atoms re remain and re-thermalize and become colder. Um, so we still can do evaporative cooling in this time uh, because it's such a long time scale. So actually, we, we learned how to cool in this, in this region here for a couple of hundred milliseconds or so, uh, and then start the experiment, say, around here. 
uh, where there was still a finite density, uh, sorry, um, uh, center of mass difference between the two clouds, uh, but they were now colder uh, or hotter. We could also heat up the gas in this in this time. We could uh, explore the the behavior as a function of temperature. Now, can I ask, so, so mm -hmm. they collide, they bounce off, and then they come back in because of the trap or not? Oh yeah, so there's the always the a trap on. Um, so kind in, of in this direction, uh, so this axial direction, there is a harmonic trap. Uh, it's just given by our magnetic field curvature that, that, I, that I showed at the beginning. It pushes them back together. Pushes them back together. Regularly, they are trapped by this focused laser beam, right. right. uh, so which is essentially on this scale of this graph, it's essentially just a tube. It's a very long tube. Mm -hmm. So radially, it's always the same potential. Axially, it's a very harmonic uh, potential. So essentially, it's, it's a story in one tube. So it's far from being one D. It's very three D. But it's, it's essentially a tube. But I'm trying to say, so, but if you were on the molecular side, would they get sucked in? I mean, would they? It, it turns out no. They so still bounce off. Still on the molecular side, they bounce off. And actually, I think in the next slide, I, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so I will show uh, the evolution towards okay. resonance. As a function of As a function of interaction. Okay. Yeah. So, so we see also these, these pictures. Uh, during the evolution, um, we, we uh, see pictures where Clearly, the density difference in the center has now somehow become equal. Uh, sorry, the density difference has become zero, and and it seems like a condensate grows out of this. Um, so usually, when we see these kind of pictures, we immediately say, oh, "Wait a second, phase separation between the superfluid and, and the magnetized gas." So it, it makes complete sense. Uh, we haven't checked with the sweep experiments whether they actually have a condensate there. That's right. Um, but you it, it, mm -hmm. it keeps oscillating, but eventually. It equilibrates to a condensed state. So uh, yeah, so uh, uh, state. Uh, exactly. So at large, actually, pretty pretty soon, on the molecular side, like within like hundred milliseconds or so, uh, all the all the guys that overlap in the center, they form form molecules rather quickly. There's still a lot of there's still a lot of unbalanced guys on the wings, which take a long time to shuffle in. And diffuse. Okay. And and uh, that's this diffusion. Uh, so here, after half a half a second. You see, the contrast has gone down a lot, uh, so a lot of these atoms have have <coughs> up, but there's still a, a size of molecule. Because you're only showing the difference, you're not showing the total. Right? Yes. So this is the difference. This would be the total. Okay. The total sh looks innocent. You would think, oh, that's just a pair of Fermi gas. Or, yeah, I, I mean, you cannot look at it and say it's pair, but you know, these these guys um, add resonance out of this best superfluid ever. They pair up, um, but you see, aha, it's still magnetized. If you look at the density difference. Uh, here's the evolution as a function of the direction strength. This was the non interacting story where they just fly through each other happily and don't know anything about each other. So I'm showing here the center of mass difference, and it just oscillates back and forth because the two clouds do, do just this. And uh, as we increase the interactions, you, you start to get very quickly overdamped. Uh, so this is still, so you see one oscillation, but then we are overdamped, and the bouncing starts to happen. Roughly, as always, when the interaction strength, when the scattering length becomes on the order of the interparticle space. Now we see the first bounces to appear. Bounce, bounce, bounce. That happens at 1,000 A now, 1,200. Um, and more and more bounces occur. And here on resonance, we have like six ish bounces. And it takes a long while for them to settle. Here, I sped up the evolution. From here to here is one second. And from here to here is 200 milliseconds. And even on the BCS side, where you would say, oh, maybe this story is completely different. No, it's still just very strong interacting, so it goes very, very slowly as well. Uh, this is showing the time scale for the decay as a function of the interaction strength. Uh, no surprise, it is peaked around the resonance. Uh, a slight comment is, so this is the molecular side where we, where we have a molecular bound state in, two, in the two-value physics. And here we have three atoms. The peak, by the way, is a little bit shifted. I would say it's rather here than at the calculated position of the resonance. Uh, Can I ask a but some some qualitative yeah. question? So the velocity, yeah. how would it uh, uh, compare to the Fermi velocity? Is it comparable or small or large? The velocity of, of the... Uh, of, 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 of the clouds, of the, the relative yeah. velocity of the clouds. So initially, when we separate them quite a bit, we separate them by almost uh, one Fermi radius. And then, well, they will have time, uh, one traffic period, uh, half a 
telling you time to speed up, so they will have a velocity uh, um, which uh, will be comparable to the Fermi velocity. So everything is or the unit in this problem. Yeah. problem. So well, because you are on mm. uh, and, and yeah. the unit therapy, so uh, there are no small large parameters. Right? Uh, well, we could decide to just separate them a lot yeah. and then slam them into each other. Or other way way higher. Or other way around. Or other way around. Start with zero uh, velocity. It turns out for, for the coldest data, we try to arrange things such that they're split only a little bit and with zero initial velocity. So and then, since the diffusion is so slow, they will never have time to really catch up to a very high drift velocity. They will always drift very slowly. So, so that the drift velocity, which is the velocity of the center of mass uh, uh, difference, um, is, uh, can be rather small. It can be much smaller than the frame. And if it's much smaller, how would it affect uh, I know, the kinetics of the relaxation of kinetics. Um, uh, will relaxation uh, kinetics slow down if the relative velocity is much smaller than from So you're asking for the velocity dependence of the scattering rate or something like, like that, right? Yes. We address this question by looking at the temperature dependence of the of this rate. Because uh, see, uh, it's in, roughly in, in the opposite limit, if your yeah. velocity is much larger uh, than uh, uh, the, the, the Fermi uh, uh, the, uh, the thermal velocity, then uh, 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 the scattering cross section will depend uh, uh, will depend Absolutely. on, 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 on yeah. the velocity. Exactly. And effectively, it will penetrate it deeper. Yeah. It will also penetrate yeah. deeper. Absolutely. So for, for us, what was the easiest was not to control the drift velocity, but to control temperature, so, uh, which has the same effect yes. of making the scattering cross section uh, energy dependent on small and high temperatures. And so I will now show you. I almost a couple of slides. Then we are done. It's fantastic. Um, so here's the, the realization of the spin current. Uh, it can only be due to spin up down collisions. Uh, that, that's a note mostly for common well, people who, who have, of course, spin up up collisions uh, going on all the time as well um, between electrons. But for us, it's just up down. We have a resonance scattering cross section which goes like um, the, the Fermi wavelength squared or the interparticle spacing squared. The mean free path is then just the interparticle spacing. Uh, that kind of situation where the mean free path is on the order of the interparticle spacing, well, that's the best you can do in a, in a liquid uh, in, the, in the absence of some localization effects where you get completely stuck. It's the best you can do to have a mean free path, which is just the path from one to the next partner. So that's uh, sometimes called a perfect liquid. Um, the collision rate, of course, as the units work out, that it has to go like Fermi energy very, very fast. Um, in the absence of Pauli blocking. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, and then if you calculate, okay, so what's my diffusion constant for this kind of gas? How, how long does it take for these guys to diffuse? So mean free path squared over the collision time, you plug in things, get h bar over m, which we like. Yeah. That's, yes, that's but you know, the collision rate that you are writing down, it's, uh, it doesn't take into account the Pauli block. Exactly, which I just said. <laughs> but, you know, what does it mean in reality? Uh -huh. You have to have temperature comparable to the Fermi energy of water. Very good, yes, exactly. Uh, which will be discussed in a, in a second. Uh, just for a sense of scale, h bar over m, I never thought about it that way, but it turns out it's 100 microns squared per second. Yeah. If you think about it in terms of diffusion constant, that's the numbers. And our clouds are 100 microns long, it takes roughly a second. So it gives you the, the right scale of things. And now, uh, how, how do we uh, get at these microscopic parameters from our macroscopic experiment? Well, it turns out the uh, difference in the center of mass really obeys this uh, simple damped harmonic oscillator. Of course, we don't have the d double dot if it's over damped. And uh, this coefficient here, which is slowing down the motions, is called the spin drag coefficient. Um, and uh, we can just uh, we can just measure this decay, get the fit the time scale, and from the known trapping frequency in the x direction, we get the spin drag uh, uh, coefficient, which turns out to be on the order of the Fermi energy, so on the order of kilohertz, um, which which makes sense. Oh, here I have lots of theory. That's not good. Okay, so if you have some question on theory, I have a slide for it. Um, maybe what we can take away from this is that. Uh, we have some universal laws for how the, uh, how the spin drag coefficient should behave as a function of temperature in the high temperature regime. Um, it's, it's kind of nice. Uh, 
if, if you go through this Boltzmann equation business, you get a, a spin drag coefficient, which is nothing else than the classical at high temperature, the classical collision rate, n sigma v, yeah, density scaling cross section velocity. And there's a factor in front, which for a trapped system can't, turns out to be two thirds. Uh, it's that's some fun business. And uh, at unitarity, the, the, you can figure out, ah, it should be 0 0.32 square root of E Fermi over, two, uh, over T. So it goes like 1 over square root of, of T. Um, that makes sense because sigma is the de Broglie wavelength squared, which goes like 1 over T. The velocity goes like square root of T, so then our collision rate goes like 1 over square root of T. Yeah. It's, it's kind of nice. Um, now, if anyone finds a factor of two uh, in, in this calculation, I would be very happy to know, uh, <laughs> because I need it. Um, so the, the story is, uh, for any temperature, the spin drag must be a diversion function of temperature. At high temperatures, it should go like 1 over squared of t. At low temperatures, it should be Pauli blocked. So it should, the, the scaling cross-section goes down like t squared. So it should look like something like that. For a Fermi gas, now we don't really have a a happy Fermi gas, we have also the superfluid part of it, and it's all strongly interacting. We might have pairing in the buff TC. Uh, well, this is what, what, what we measure. Uh, um, these are different traps. So all the data, the, the blue, red, green, they're all taken in very different axial traps, and they all collapse uh, nicely to the same uh, curve. You see now why I want the factor of two. This is the prediction, so to speak, that, uh, well, so that's I calculated that number. In other words, very likely that there's a factor of two problem. Um, we'll see about that. I would love that curve to be down there, but it's not. Um, I can do the same story for the diffusion constant. We have the spin drag. Boltzmann gives, or the Einstein relation gives you D, the diffusion constant is kT over M, and it's one over this spin drag coefficient at high temperature. Um, it has to go like T over TF to the three half turns out, again universal, and also get a prediction for the prefactor, which should actually be quite good at high temperatures, uh, from, from what I read in books. Um, so, uh, th and this is what you would expect for all temperatures, at low temperatures should again be suppressed due to Pauli blocking. So there should be maybe some universal minimum, um, so universal, uh, some minimum at finer temperature of the diffusion constant around T over TF of 0.5, or who knows, 0.2. Uh, now we know, because there's <laughs> that's the diffusion constant that we measure. Um, it, it goes over really quite a long, long uh, large scale of, of parameters as a function of temperature. We don't see the upturn at very low temperatures. Instead, we see it apparently level, level uh, out. Uh, here we actually enter the superfluid regime. So uh, there, there is a funny business going on then. We might have superfluid in the center and spin ups and spin downs trying to make their way around. I'll show you a picture in a second of, of that. And here again, if you find this factor of two, I would be very happy. It's the same factor of two there. We are not going to remeasure this. This is cast in stone. <laughs> this is what it is. This is just all the data as a function of all the different traffic frequencies. It all nicely collapses to the same to the same curve. What is now very nice is uh, well, I find maybe it's not that surprising, but uh, I found it kind of nice that uh, from this data we immediately get the spin susceptibility, something that's interesting for answering questions of is there a Fermi liquid state, uh, Fermi, sorry, um, is there a ferromagnetic state uh, for positive scattering lengths, that kind of stuff, that should signal its presence by a divergence in the spin susceptibility. Uh, so you switch on an epsilon magnetic field and suddenly everyone says up or down. And, and this is it. We get it from the uh, fact that the spin current can be driven by a gradient in the chemical potentials with a prefect given by the spin conductivity, which is nothing else than uh, the density times the uh, uh, spin drag time, which is 1 over gamma. Uh, or it can be driven by a density gradient. Uh, in our case, we of course have both. So by just taking the ratio of those two numbers, which we both measure, measure in the experiment, we get this, this curve. Um, and of, uh, what's surprising is it, it well, well, it depends whether you find it surprising, but uh, an ideal Fermi gas would saturate at low temperatures, because now only the guys right at the Fermi surface can contribute to the spin susceptibility. This will level off roughly at the uh, 
um, the density of states uh, at, the, at the Fermi energy. Now we see rather that it, it goes really high up there, almost following the classical prediction, uh, which doesn't know about Pauli blocking. Uh, it might level off here. Uh, don't want to say which is classic, so I don't know what's that. You see the error bars. But uh, it's, it's kind of kind of nice. Um, at high temperatures, luckily the factor of two cancels out between <laughs> sigma and D. And I'm so happy to see that this is this is exactly following the, the classic result. So maybe we'll just publish that, not the rest. <laughs> <laughs> So that's nice. So, so, uh, to, to, uh, so, so what do you oh, conclude? Is there a ferromagnetism? Ah, uh, uh, no. Uh, so <laughs> we, uh, sorry. So, so I haven't shown this, but the, well, I almost showed it. You saw that the maximum, the slowest time scale for this behavior was actually on resonance. If you go towards the positive scattering length side of things, it actually, the diffusion becomes faster. Uh, so you're further away from the uh, supposedly ferromagnetic uh, transition where the diffusion should stop completely. So, well, from from our experiment, I don't see um, I don't see a ferromagnetic state. However, I should say that of course molecules are formed in the process as we move these spin ups into the spin downs. Maybe they affect the diffusion. Maybe they help the diffusion uh, and somehow don't allow the complete separation between spin up and spin down to to be sustained. Um, the fact that there is another way out, the fact that there is pairing possible, might uh, might um, be at the end of the ferromagnetic state. If this shows the only ferrum, and if you have a putative fully polarized ferromagnet, then the domain wall is not stable. Looks like, yeah. Right. But probably uh, because we have a partially polarized ferromagnet. Mm -hmm. So some molecules and still some some spin ups that no, no but uh, polarization of the ferromagnet is not hundred percent. It's not hundred percent. I mean that we if you we have of the course stability of the domain wall of that does not exist in such thing. Right. I mean in the beginning you saw the, the bouncing. Maybe you can think of this bouncing as being the system wanting to stay a fairly polarized to stay fully polarized. I bounce off what looks almost like a domain wall. Of course, the spin downs have a, have a smooth onset of their density. If it was really a wall, a spin down atom would bounce off completely of the spin wall. Um, but I thought it's relaxing. But, but it would, over a long time scale, I, I feel it would like to relax. The relaxation, to me, of course, is also it's a two-body story, where it's like a two, uh, like it only needs the presence of, of a couple of atoms. It doesn't need to wait for three body time scales, so I'm not sure whether the molecule story is separate from the question of the ferromagnet or whether no, but it, it is the reason that we don't see it. Well, just to make sure I understand, I mean, in that micro principle is experimentally addressed the question of whether the fully polarized ferromagnetic state is stable or not. Right? Not the issue of whether there can be a partially polarized stable ferromagnetic state. Yeah, you're looking at a domain wall where each side is fully polarized, right? Um, um, are you saying what we should do is start with an imbalanced cloud of yeah. more spin ups than oh, Okay, I'll show the picture. Okay, no, no, but, yeah. but, but why can you, if you have a balanced one, you could still have a domain wall between uh, partially polarized. Yeah. But so far, what is shown is uh, both sides are fully polarized. So 100% spin up. Colliding with the instrument well, I know, but they are relaxed to a state that's completely balanced, right? In the middle, but... Uh, they, they relax to a state that's completely spin balanced. That's the conclusion, yeah. right? They the, the final state is mixed. Mix. Mix. Right, but they could, if there was a partially polarized... They could have relaxed something, but okay, then you get into... You would get now a domain between... Maybe it's yeah. for somebody that's easier for it to relax into this completely mixed state. Doesn't show that it's partially polarized thing at all. Well, I would think it was if that would, if it was the equilibrium state was a uh, partially polarized ferromagnet, then you could relax to that and then satisfy the the condition of spin neutrality, spin balance by phase separating the two two states. Right? 
Yeah, it just seems to do that. Seems to do that. Uh, I think it's still addressing that. Oh. I would also vote you. <laughs> well, so the, the, the concluding couple of things, it's, uh, it's a very slow spin relaxation, it uh, takes forever, seconds. Um, got the spin drag coefficient. Uh, see that the diffusion constant seems to separate to a universal h bar over m kind of value. Um, we don't know what happens at extremely low temperatures. That would be, would be nice. And there, there would be a superfluid. It might be very, very hard to uh, enter there if you're spin up atoms. So you might want to go around. Um, and we observe this t to the 3 half law um, with a factor of 2, which I have to find. Um, and we measure this thing susceptibility. Um, so now for the, for the imbalance story. Uh, can I ask mm. a question related to the previous one? So you also mentioned uh, that uh, maybe there is a superfluid in the medium, and then you mentioned the molecule, mm. and both of these would also need a relaxation mechanism. So do you think that there are such mechanisms, and which relaxation mechanisms are the fastest in this? Uh, yeah, so my, my personal feeling is that the molecules have an advantage. The molecule formation uh, is faster, seems to be faster than the formation, for example, of domain walls. If domain walls would form, the, the molecules could form. So I, I, I would say that means that the molecules seem to win. It, it doesn't answer the question what happens, what would happen if there were no molecules? Would then there, would there be a, a ferromagnetic state? So then we, we cannot answer because we have the molecules. Is that, is that like a well defined question? Like, Good point. Well, it looks like if you, if you do like some basic calculation, it looks like the molecules are a little bit faster, but like factor of two or three, it's not like ten or hundred. So if you took the molecules away, yes, maybe the domain formation would be much So I really have to finish this because some people are probably more completely. Uh, then, um, just showing that at very low temperatures, we see this poly blocking effect that you wanted to see. Uh, not for the spin dipole, it's very hard for us to cool in this experiment so much that we see actually ballistic motion of the spin downs and the spin ups. Uh, so far, unfortunately, it's, I mean, it's a very drastic experiment to start with and we have to cool down on all this energy that we put in. But we were able to see it in the quadrupole oscillation of the spin down cloud in the spin up cloud and see uh, for below 0.1 TF, we start seeing these nice quadrupole oscillations of the spin down in the spin up soup. Uh, above point 0.1 is still completely overdamped, but below um, we start seeing ballistic motion again. So for the polar rods, if you work with a 1090 mixture or so, uh, you do see this power blocking effect in the uh, scattering cross-section. For the balance story, that's what we have seen. Uh, in the end, we, we end up with a, uh, with a super fluid. What's really cute and intriguing, but so hard to to write about. <laughs> it's a complicated story is the slightly imbalanced uh, situation where you have uh, um, some surplus spin-ups uh, and spin-downs. Oh, that's not sad. Uh, could you move this projector a little bit to the right or to the left or so? It seems to be so Oh, no, it's on the projector. Okay. That's unfortunate. Okay, so, so what you can maybe see is uh, uh, there is an is a empty core in the density difference, meaning there's equal population in the center, and the spin-ups are outside. Um, I have a way to the way with that. Let's put it here. <laughs> okay. Uh, so now, now you see it there. So we can prepare the, the gas in such a way that the spin ups <laughs> are really on one side. And, and now the question is how do these guys make it over? <laughs> <laughs> It's still, it's burnt in or something. So that's, that's the, the, the fun question now. You have a superfluid in the center, so the spin-ups probably have a hard time to enter the superfluid. They much rather want to walk around. Here's the final state we know is this shell-like structure where the spin-ups occupy a shell space separator from the superfluid in the center. Uh, that's a complicated story. Uh, so we have movies of this issue. <laughs> uh, 
quantum yeah, model is the problem. That's it. We have a new apparatus, so more stuff to come now on lithium-6, potassium-41, and potassium-40. Actually, we have cooled all three together, which is nice. So we can hopefully do the experiments now also with some in the mass events in the near future. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah.